My name is Sverker Sörlin. Uh, I'm a professor of environmental history at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, um, where I'm also the uh, co-founder of the Environmental Humanities Laboratory. And I am uh, also a, a writer and a critic and a public intellectual uh, in Sweden, uh, and with a, quite a bit of interest also in uh, policy advice and working uh, with uh, with such issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, right now uh, we're at the uh, uh, Anthropocene campus at the uh, Haus der Kultur in der Welt, uh, a, a museum in uh, in Berlin, uh, where a ten-day uh, major teach-in is going on. Uh, about a hundred uh, PhD students and postdocs from all over the world basically have assembled along with 30 instructors for also from all over the world to, uh, to discuss uh, in an experimental way uh, what the Anthropocene is as a concept and what it means and what it can, what it can do. Um, it's kind of an experimental enterprise. It's uh, both a conversation and also um, work with uh, art and design. And, uh, and it's also a range of uh, disciplines involved. People have different backgrounds here, both in the sciences, the humanities, social sciences. Um, and they certainly a good, good deal of the participants are also uh, artists and with design backgrounds. So it's really a lively, lively thing going on. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> where it's going to end and probably it doesn't end. Probably this is just part of something ongoing because the Anthropocene as a concept right now is something uh, where there is a lot of uh, thinking going on because it is far from clear what it, what it means. Um, it has a sort of a narrow definition which is more like geological but I think also it has captured a lot of interest among the social sciences and humanities because it involves somehow bigger issues of how we frame our condition uh, as humanity on the planet, basically. Well, my role here has been to be part of the uh, of a, of one workshop called uh, Imaging. Uh, and uh, it, it is, of course, about images in, in, in one sense, about various representations of, uh, of the Earth and uh, of the Anthropocene, but also, and I think more importantly, it is also about imaginaries, about how we imagine and can imagine the, the current, the situation that, we, uh, that is brought by the uh, Anthropocene. And uh, we had two full days of uh, intense discussions and, and also artwork. Uh, and we wanted, as instructors, we wanted the, the participants to uh, move towards concrete expressions. So they, they actually designed um, uh, I images or imaginaries or in indeed objects, actually, um, uh, that had some kind of relationship to, to the Anthropocene. Uh, and um, it is also, I think, it, th th such a process is interesting, not least because it is not obvious where you're going to end up. Uh, it, it is a major scale to the concept of the Anthropocene, but how do you actually bring that down into manageable uh, expressions and forms? Um, uh, recently, there has been a discussion about the concept of hyper-objects and maybe the Anthropocene is a hyper object. It's, it's like a major phenomena that somehow stands, occupies a particular uh, 
position uh, in our uh, universe of thinking and it's, it's, um, it still seems to be in a phase where it, it is not at all clear what, what it, 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 it is no clear definition. Uh, and that was, I think, came out very strongly in, the, in this uh, work. It's much exciting, yeah. Yeah, um, I've, uh, I'm right now working uh, quite a bit on uh, climate change and the various discourses on climate change. Uh, and um, I'm particularly interested in, in the, the knowledge uh, built up for climate change science. Uh, and even more particularly, I'm interested in the history of glaciology, how glaciers have been identified and used as climate indicators and how a certain epistemic community has formed around glaciology and have, has come into conversation over, in the, particularly in the 20th century, with um, other epistemic uh, communities, uh, and, and then particularly those working on, with models and, uh, and approaches from uh, physics and meteorology. So, uh, and, and they all work uh, by and large on, this, on a similar phenomenon, namely climate change. But uh, the way they arrive to, their, to, 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 their, uh, to climate change is very different. Uh, and that is why it's very useful to think about them as different uh, epistemic cultures. Um, the glaciologists work in the field, they collect data on a massive scale. They measure and they repeatedly go back and measure. The, 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 the glaciers are a slow medium, whereas the uh, commu computer-based, uh, more theoretically oriented meteorologists and geophysicists tend to work with, with, with models that can produce new, new versions of climate change very rapidly. Uh, and uh, so the, for a long time, this, this brought these two communities into a pretty tense relationship. And I'm very interested in this, how, 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 how the, you, 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 you tend to come to think about the same kind of problem in different ways because of your methodologies and your disciplinary background. So that is uh, where I do quite a bit of work. Um, I'm also interested in, in, in ice more generally as a medium. Uh, and I'm, I've, I've sort of, uh, proposed that we, we should talk about a cryo history, cryo for ice. Uh, not only do we have a cryosphere, we also have a cryo history, uh, increasingly important because, uh, uh, because uh, ice is this uh, medium that somehow responds to, to climate change. And ice is an anthropocenic medium, you could say. And it is also a very rapidly growing interest from both from artists, photographers, researchers, and also in the media about um, both terrestrial ice glaciers and sea ice. Um, and particularly, many people follow with interest what's happening in the Arctic Ocean, for example, with, with, the, uh, with a shrinking ice cover uh, in the summer. And um, it, so there's a certain ethics and morals and politics connected to this because the changes in the cryosphere, the cryohistory that is unfolding, somehow speaks to what humans do, what societies do to their environments, how they consume fossil fuels, uh, how, they, um, how they consume more generally, how they, basically the, the metabolism of the planet is reflected through, through the cryosphere. And, and uh, you could say that my research is an attempt to decode uh, this uh, evolution uh, or this, this development of this relationship between human societies and, uh, and, the, uh, and the planet as mediated through ice. Uh, and my particular interest is, is then where the knowledge production around these things happen. Uh, and they, they happen in, in, in the field and they happen in the, in the laboratories or in, in libraries and... and, and uh, also, I think it's interesting to see the transfer of this knowledge to the um, decision-making communities. Scientists have a lot of influence, but they ultimately don't decide on so, so many things in, in political or economic terms. But the influence, 
and set the parameters of much of those discussions. But it's a very, very elastic and problematic relationship. So, uh, and then again, we enter into the realm of, of, of justice, equity, distribution. Uh, where is the wealth being consumed? Where is the, the wealth, how is the wealth distributed? Uh, and what is the, uh, how are the responsibilities for the, these impacts on the planet distributed? So ICE, uh, although it may seem a fugitive and very marginal phenomenon, becomes then a sort of a political, it gains a political weight through these processes. So you could say my research is somehow uh, um, encompassing all these dimensions of all ICE uh, uh, that I just described. Well, it's, it's a, a surprisingly long history, actually, behind this. It's uh, already 25, 30 years ago, when I was a very young historian, I started doing work on the uh, history of natural resources as a, the debates on how to use nature. Uh, and that was in a Scandinavian context uh, and about, you know, uh, forests, uh, 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 minerals, uh, hydroelectric power, and things like that. And in the course of that work, I discovered that, that um, those scientists that tried to identify these resources, they were also very often interested in, 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 in the number of features of, 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 of nature, for including glaciers. And much of that early work on, that, that the scientists did on glaciers it was not at all related to their, whether they sh were shrinking or growing. It was um, much more to do with how they were majestic and beautiful and said something about the, the nation. So they became sort of national monuments that derived some of their significance from science. So I identified science as a sort of a producer of significance for different areas outside of science itself. Uh, and then, um, over the years, uh, I became increasingly involved in, in, in policy advice and, I was, and the climate discussion came up and I, I constantly returned to the glaciers and found that uh, they gained new significance. And I was also starting doing work in the 90s, particularly on the Arctic. And in the Arctic there is a lot of ice, all kinds of ice. And I started doing work, more work on scientists working there and then I sort of gradually became involved in the in how the, uh, I realized how this the use of glaciers as climate indicators started coming up. And by then I ex more generally turned my interest towards environmental history. So sort of combining these things, the glaciers, the role of science, the environmental change and the policy, that became my own personal internal laboratory, so to speak, where these things started combining in new ways. And, uh, from there on, it, uh, it sort of it started growing. So I started encompassing, uh, seeing new, more and more uh, uses for to to uh, to, to regard um, ice uh, as something that uh, had more significance than would first meet the eye, so to speak. Um, I suppose that's the the general background to this interest. Uh, then, of course, also there has been a growth in literature in, in, in both the geographical sciences and in the historical sciences. Historians have, you're, that's right, w historians have arrived fairly late to this, but um, I think in the Anthropocene or in the current period, historians are doing more and more things to do with uh, reinterpreting, reframing human nature, human earth, human planet, social planet, relationships. That's an ongoing phenomenon. Uh, um, my prediction is that this will continue to grow actually because it's we all what we also do is we reframe history. We go back and we reread and reinterpret uh, things that that we used not to think of as important. They become important again uh, or maybe they become important for the first time because we realize that they have a significance for for what's going on now. Uh, uh, this d does not make previous kinds of history, for example, political history or economic history, less important, but it just adds new layers and, and it, it increases repercussions. It also, I think, in a certain way, reframes geographies. 
we, we tend to think about, there's been a very strong centrality to Europe and in previous historiography in most parts of the world actually. Also in other parts of the world there's been a centrality to the West. But this is also now changing as uh, there is a new geopolitics of things. Again, I think ge the geopolitics is very important here and, and uh, resources stand very important in, in the geopolitics. So um, it is both a story of a personal way of approaching but combined with uh, the kind of uh, context where I've been finding my, myself over the last couple of decades. Yeah, I think there is a very important relationship between history and, and the Anthropocene, uh, perhaps primarily because uh, it changes the very, uh, it changes what history is. It changes also who are historians. Uh, I think increasingly we are seeing now uh, scientists appearing as historians. Uh, scientists tend to in the Anthropocene to start thinking much more about time, about what, is, what, is, what happened before the deep past and also the deep future, and how they, these are related. So, and and they, they start reinterpreting their own facts. They, they start, in fact, the very invention of a new historical period or a new geological period uh, as science-based is, is, is making a call on, on them. And, and we see this happening, for example, in, in the phenomenon of so-called big history, where, where uh, very long timescales are uh, used. We see collaborations between the geological sciences, archaeologists and historians appearing in, in new ways. We see um, uh, topics that are addressed by, by scientists like, for example, extinctions, or major climate change, uh, which involves necessarily long time spans. In fact, it's gone so far, I would say, <laughs> that some of the uh, hegemony on the interpreting time and history has shifted partly over to the, to the scientists. And so in a sense, when the historians are now more slowly entering into this discussion, it is also as a way of, um, reclaiming some of the defining um, uh, power over this. Uh, not that there is anything particularly wrong with, <laughs> with what the scientists tell us, but clearly historians can contribute also much more to this and, and add nuance and also start questioning some of the perhaps tendencies towards determinacy that may come when you use a, a strictly science uh, uh, perspective and particularly establish the links between what's going on in the uh, environmental realm, so to speak, with, with societies, with individuals and groups and, and cultures and religions and so on, which might be hard for scientists to sort of bring to the picture. Uh, and also, almost by implication, what this calls for and also is also happening is, is more collaboration between various strands of history. So history and historiography is changing into a more, into a broader, more science-informed enterprise. Uh, and that in turn affects history. So th it's been a clear tendency over the past maybe f 10 years, I should say, that there's a marked growth in environmental history and related historical fields. And also among geographers, uh, uh, there is a strong trend towards history. And, uh, and, and so climate comes with history, in a sense. Uh, and the Anthropocene comes with history. Uh, it's, it's still, however, early days. And I, I, I reckon this will, will, will continue to grow and it will differentiate and diversify. And one of the new labels that have been put on this work, because it's not only history, it's also other strands of the humanities and social sciences, is, is the label environmental humanities, uh, which, which is, I think, out there be, partly because um, there is a need to integrate strands of 
humanity's knowledge. So um, that I think at least is, is part of the answer and some of the new journals uh, only from the last couple of years is evidence of this. I think also one can note that one, somebody might say you know that environmental history has been there for a long time. It started back in the early 70s but uh, in the first several decades I'd say that, that, that field grew only modestly. It was just one among a, a range of, of fair, various sub-disciplines of history. But what has happened in the last five to ten years is it's like skyrocketed. And, and I, I think it's obvious that this new interest is linked to the emerging debates on the... There's an urgency about, around the Anthropocene and around climate change that calls for, for um, answers that can historians and other humanities people can, can provide. Uh, and for example, look at this major discussion around, uh, around uh, the responsibilities for climate change. I mean, who, who's going to carry the, the burden of, of, of the sacrifices that may be necessary? Uh, that is a major political and distributional issue. You cannot deal with that unless you have some wider understanding of, of the role of societies and, and econo economies in, 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 in this. You need to look at stratification, not only of the geology, but also stratification of societies. Who are rich, who are poor, and how are they going to be affected, and what have they contributed in the past? Uh, these are very important uh, aspects of this. Yeah, uh, actually I think all relationships with the climate uh, is cultural in the sense that uh, um, it's about how human societies um, make their living and what technologies and, and, and other equipments they use for that and how they use resources for that and how they create myths and stories uh, about that. We do that today as well, it's only that it's so much more complex than it used to be in, 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 in more smaller, uh, more isolated societies. But it's basically always the same thing. And also the big difference is we do it on such a major scale because we're so many and we, we, our circulation of matter is so enormously large. Um, so, and I think the, in a sense it's nothing special when, when historians in general or environmental historians explain this and elucidate this, what we tend to do is we simply rewrite history. We, we provide uh, stories of how this happens. And I can just give you one example uh, that is particularly illustrative, I think, and that, that is when we study um, uh, Arctic communities, uh, which still are mostly quite small and also um, uh, somehow uh, located in way, in, in, not in isolation, they are as, as connected as anybody else, but they can, the way they find their living is very much affected by climate change, through, 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 again through ice as a mediator. Ice is melting more quickly than before and it's very unsecure and uncertain. And if you then study uh, their traveling technologies, their hunting the patterns, the way they, they gain their living, you find that that is a clear-cut example of how they need to adapt to climate change that they were in the first place not responsible for. So um, that is an, a, a particularly clear-cut expression. But on the other hand, you can go to the far, other far end of the extreme and look at the growth of, of, of cities, for example. Uh, major new uh, or old <laughs> Chinese cities that are, are growing tremendously and using a lot of energy and other resources. Uh, and as soon as you start to unpack those stories, it's, it, it has happened pretty recently but it's still something that, that is part of, uh, of a historical uh, pattern of growth. Look at the urbanization of America, a sort of a 150 year phenomenon basically, and it's, it's a disaster, you could say, from, from a climate point of view. But the American culture is a, is a culture which uh, praises this industrialization, praises suburbia, praises the car society, uh, praises the kind of mobility that has certainly led to a, a tremendous economic growth, but has also uh, pr provided a very s sad relationship with, with climate. 
So as soon as you start telling stories about usual things that historians do talk about, for example, urban growth, urban history, economic history, you find that you can introduce the element of climate uh, in, in all these stories and, and it be becomes a richer story, becomes a more ethical, moral and political story. It talks about responsibilities and justice and things like that, almost by, by implication. Uh, so uh, I think that this is, so it is not that we leave the kind of history we, all, we always did and the methodologies and the virtues of the profession, they all, are all there. We, we add more things, we add related to climate and then I think we also add a new sense of urgency. I think it's useful here to compare with what historians did several generations ago, maybe even in the 19th century. Um, and they still do that in some, to some extent, particularly new nations that are recently being formed. Uh, that historians often provide legitimacy. They provide some kind of argument that we own this territory, or we have always been here. Our kings was, had those names and they did those brave things and they simplified, of course. But they tend to be around forming nations. Uh, so this is what is called the methodological nationalism. And there are certainly other ways of writing history, but that has been very pervasive, and it's extremely pervasive in museums and in schools. Uh, I think the period we're in now, uh, historians are reorientating themselves towards more global issues around resources, geopolitics, uh, climate, uh, and other elements of the Anthropocene. And that is, uh, I think, also a very useful change in the historical profession. So uh, elucidation, uh, with the examples that historians can give is part and parcel also of reshaping history itself. Yeah, I think it's very important uh, for historians and people in the humanities and social sciences to think about policy. Um, uh, and my own experience uh, as advising the Swedish government for a long time, both on research and education policy and on environmental policy, is um, that um, it is a long-term enterprise. You, 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 you need to be uh, patient. You, you need to persist uh, on your ideas. You need to be uh, pedagogical and, 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 and so on. But it's also, I think, a matter of um, allowing uh, politics to speak to you so that uh, you realize that the, the f general framework of, of what, what you're going to say, so uh, it's not just a transportation belt so you can send things over. Um, in just uh, earlier this year, we, we published a book from the um, uh, advisory science advisory group to the Ministry of the Environment and it was called the um, uh, New uh, Environmental Playing Field where we tried to, to summarize, we were 12 scholars and scientists from a range of disciplines, tried to sum up what was the, the current situation which was very much an international and planetary situation that we sketched. Uh, we think that um, that politics in most countries has been too isolated and, and that's certainly been true for Sweden as well. Uh, although environmental policy in Sweden has, has been pretty okay, so it's, it still hasn't really been up to the time. So we have, in a, over 200 pages, we explained this situation uh, and, and it was pretty well received, I should say. And uh, I think that is partly what, for example, history and the humanities can do is to elaborate on the conditions, the framework conditions for policy. Historians normally cannot suggest anything about um, <coughs> levels of uh, phosphor or, uh, or uh, P pH levels in, 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 in the sea or something like that. That's for the scientists to do. But the main thrust of politics is much more complex. The science is just one element of it. It's about finding ways forward for societies and how to do that in a, in a, in a re reasonable and decent way. Uh, 
And, and, and that is an extremely complex judgmental thing. And, and I think in, in, in describing the situation, laying up the problem, so to speak, finding where the fault lines are, and also um, bringing the complexity to the policy process, that is a work, a kind of work that could be done uh, at least as good by people from the humanities and social sciences as from the sciences and, and medicine and so on. It's, um, it's just that you need to take on board the, the science too. You need to, to, to do your homework in terms of understanding the science to be able to do that. Uh, uh, and that has been underestimated, I should say. Uh, there, there has been also too little interest, basically, from the humanities. Uh, I often try to think about the environmental period, like from 1945 onward, when the environment has become a major social problem. In the early days of that, you, could, you saw many examples of, of humanities and social science people coming in, and even artists, addressing the problem, formulating the, the, the situation. But when the expertise was growing for in the environment, it became almost universally defined as a science expertise. There was nothing necessary with this. It is, was just a historical process that we can now start to understand. And I think we are looking back at that in order, because we now see that this was not enough. We need to broaden the, the, the knowledge foundation for, for that. And that's where the, uh, the humanities and historians uh, come in. And I, I'm, again, reasonably optimistic about this. I think there is a, a growing demand. And I think this whole conversation about the Anthropocene is a good, good example of that, that I sense that uh, complex thinking and complexity thinking is in higher demand now than it was only a decade ago. Well, the future, um, I often try to say this, that uh, it is difficult enough to say anything meaningful uh, about the past. Uh, and we often fight a lot among historians what we can actually say about the past. So, how difficult shouldn't it be to say anything meaningful about the future? Still, we need to do that. We, it's, 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 uh, it's what we own collectively, is, is, is the future. Uh, and we need to be, have some opinion about that. My own opinion is that it will, it will certainly be drastic changes, but sometimes also I think it will always be a future that is identifiable. We have had enormous change in the past, but still, at least over a time frame of many generations, people who would travel across those time frames would, if you could do that in a time machine, they would still be able to understand roughly what is going on. They will have to encounter some new technologies, they will, they will have to encounter some new ideas, and, but they, and sometimes they even have to adapt their language, but they will still be living in the same basic uh, universe uh, of, of modernity, let's say. Uh, so, and I, I, in that sense, I think that, that sort of general frame will still remain. I have a very hard time seeing that the shifts will be so, so drastic that you cannot recognize yourself within a century. And I think this is import, an important message because sometimes when you talk about in the Anthropocene discourse, about the disastrous and momentous changes that's going to happen. They, they can certainly happen. But I still think that these will be within the understandable. When we call for concerted action, we call for major drastic reductions, for example, of in CO2 emissions. This is also, it's enormous, change, the change we ask, but it's still within what we can perceive as possible. We don't need to to learn in a totally new language for that. We, we, we could even have uh, an economics that is by and large as it is now. And it's important to say this, I think, because sometimes people simply give up. They think that the changes that are needed are so enormous that there's no way even trying, that there's a, an element of fatalism sometimes in the discussion, which I think is very dangerous. So that's why I sort of emphasize that change is there, but it will still be within the kind of framework that humans 
ordinary humans can understand. Thank you.